Stormy Grace's YouTube Academy. This is SJ Anderson and I'm here today to teach a short course on housing systems or house systems. This will be an introductory course which I hope you can gain some kernels of high level maybe conceptual understanding that you can take with you um, to further your studies of house systems and make that decision that every astrologer has to make, that big decision often of what house system you will use in your practice. So again, my name is S.J. Anderson, and I'm here for Stormy Grace's YouTube Academy. Very happy to be here and very happy to provide this introduction to you. I want to start here um, by just saying a few, uh, a main, main, major point, which is this is an extremely complex topic, um, and it's a controversial one. I'd say out of all the things astrologers fight about amongst themselves, which house system or which housing system is the best or the one that astrologers recommend there's often disputes about it you know every six every few months really i was going to say six months but i think it's even um, a, a smaller interval you'll find on places like twitter big debates about why uh, people's pet housing system is is better than maybe other astrologers so just know it's controversial and it's complex and i encourage you to just keep a very open mind about this you know it's good to have some humility when you talk about houses or think about houses and just understand that other people have a different opinion and they have a strongly held notion of what they like to use for their practice and their art remember astrology is ultimately in a way an art and that is to say individual astrologers express their own selfhood and their own kind of version of reality through you know what they're drawn to and what the tool that they choose to use and, and one way you can think about a house system as part of the tool of it's one tool of the toolbox um, of tools that astrologers have and so you I would never criticize an artist for using a certain brush stroke or a certain brush size when that final product is, is so beautiful and many astrologers using all house systems have a beautiful final product of the art of their astrology that is to say for me providing meaning to people studying the movement of the planets and then um, filtering those movements into meaning on this earthly realm that's to me what astrology is so i encourage you to give freedom to um, astrologers to make the choices that they're going to make about the house systems that they want to employ or deploy the other thing is that you're likely going to need to go deeper to fully grasp the astronomical issues and even the astro astrological issues that I'll be presenting here. Very complex to even visualize how the earth is moving in the different ways it moves um, that then uh, astrologers use those movements to make calculations to divide the ecliptic into these segments, these 12 segments. Okay, so let's, let's go here first. I guess I should say I don't have a slide here um, but just to, before we even begin this, I mean, house, the houses, the astrological houses are just um, 12 uh, segments. So we divide up the sky into these 12 segments. And each segment, and it's based on the primary motion of the Earth, that is to say the Earth's rotation. And so you have 12 segments that um, then the sky is divided up into. And then those positions are, per, are projected back onto the ecliptic or naturally already on the ecliptic. And so you have um, a, a, another division of 12 that in some house systems is separate from the division of 12 that is the zodiac. And, and these 12 segments um, have um, topics that um, we look at. Uh, and these are topics related to the affairs of human beings, you know. And the thing about the house systems and this division of 12 and, uh, and, and 12 topics that come from the houses is there's really full coverage on um, you know the affairs of the human heart and of the human experience and the kind of rise and fall of human beings and the struggles and the pains and the joys all of those things can be mapped to this division of 12 houses that astrologers use and I will say this, I, I should have mentioned uh, this in a slide, but this talk almost assumes kind of a basic understanding of what is a house. Um, this is really about the systems of house division rather than what are the houses. And, I, and I, maybe I should have had an introductory slide here, I didn't do that, so I'm doing this now. Um, but the houses, again, are a division of 12 that then in each of those 12 
um, houses, we, we place topics that relate to the affairs of human beings in those 12 houses. And there's another uh, course on Stormy Grace's YouTube Academy, I'm sure, that covers the houses and their significations and the topics we assign to each house. So I encourage you to do that work um, on the other parts of this course. This is going to be about how we make that division. How do we determine the boundaries of the 12 houses? And what are the different systems available? And again, it's a short introduction. So here are the three topics I hope to cover. Uh, the first will be a brief discussion of the astronomy and then the, zo the zodiac from more of an astro astronomical <laughs> perspective. And astronomy we think of as just the science of observation and all that goes into you know, so-called science. People observe the heavens and they try to you know, make materialistic determinations about what it is we're encased in as humans. And that might be something that's removed from anything other than strictly human observation of these phenomena that appear to be outside and into the heavens. Okay, this would be astronomy. There, it's not about then deriving kind of meaning um, from those movements. That would be astrology. And anytime you start talking about meaning, you get into realms that science doesn't like because these are questions of you know purpose, motivation. These are more um, non-objective. It's more of a subjective realm, meaning is. And so science doesn't like subjectivity, right? It wants pure objective observation. So that's a division between astronomy and astrology. One, might, um, one way to divide those two, this idea of meaning. So we're going to talk about the astronomy, that's just the observation. And the zodiac would be included into that because it is an astronomical division. Um, the second thing we'll talk about is an overview of some of the history of house division, um, just to, so we can understand where it, where it came from. And then lastly, I'm just going to um, discuss some of the main uh, house systems and give you some tools where you can go explore and read about them further. Um, so that's the, that's the three major points I want to hit in this talk. And let's uh, get going. You can see here actually on this slide, this is from the Solar Fire software. When you click on a house system, you can see this is just, there's like, um, this is about a, a fourth of the different house systems that they have available. Some of the major house systems, Campanus, Coke, Meridian, Moranus, Placidus, Porphyry, Regimentanus, Topocentric. It doesn't even have, I, my default is whole signs. That's not even on this drop down menu on the top. So there's many, 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 many different house systems. Um, okay, let's go. Let's move. So uh, the first major point I think we need to discuss are, is what's the zodiac? Okay, what is the zodiac? And what is the ecliptic? Two of the essential features of um, house systems because no matter the house system, um, most house systems are going to project back onto the ecliptic and give the divisions that they make of these 12 houses uh, a, an ecliptic, a degree on the ecliptic. Um, there are some, so, so yeah, just to say we're always referencing back to the ecliptic. That's, you know, fairly customary in an astrological uh, practice. And so what's the zodiac? Well, it's a division of the ecliptic. And so just not, and actually I'm going to go to my next slide first. I should have put this here. Let's talk about the ecliptic because I'm, I'm using the ecliptic in a definition. We haven't defined that. And I just want to show you, actually, sorry, I'm going to come back up here. What is the ecliptic? It's the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So from our perspective, so humans on Earth, when we look up and we see the sun's movement every day, the sun um, moves on the ecliptic. The sun never deviates from the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the, uh, the movement of the sun through the sky, through the year, right? It traces a path against the backdrop of the fixed stars. That path, from our perspective, is the ecliptic. And so here's from Wikipedia. I've got two definitions on this slide, and these are quotes. The plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. From our perspective, the sun's movement around the celestial sphere. And if, I go, if we go to the next slide, you can see here, um, this is the sunrise in a... Um, uh, photographic, uh, man, my, uh, my vocab is kind of leaving me here, but a stop, it's not a stop motion photograph, it's a, it's a, um, 
photograph where you expose the image over time and you leave that exposure. So a, a long exposure photograph maybe, or a multi-exposure uh, photograph will show you here a time lapse. I think that's the term I was looking for. This is the path of the sun and you see it's moving relative to the horizon. It's kind of low on the horizon in some places. The farther north you go, it gets lower, this path of the sun. If you're right at the equator, it's a little bit higher in the sky. But um, you can see in this um, great um, diagram that I've taken from Exeter Astrology Group, they they have an article about defining the midheaven, but I loved this diagram. And you can see how the ecliptic is lower on the sky. And this is that uh, apparent um, line that the sun draws in a given latitude. Um, and so this is what then gets divided. When we, when we create the zodiac, we divide this path of the sun into 12 parts equal parts in the tropical zodiac and in the sidereal zodiac you're dividing this path of the sun the apparent movement of the sun in the sky into 30 degree segments and this is um, just as, as fundamental as you get in the western astrological system or the vedic astrological systems this division of 12 30 degree segments we assign um, the zodiac. So if you go to the Wikipedia, I'm gonna go back to the slide above. The zodiac is an area of the sky that extends approximately eight degrees north or south. Other um, definitions will include that 12 division in the zodiac, like I just did. No, there are different zodiacs. So some people will talk about zodiacs of, of, um, that have divisions of different lengths. For example, the constellational zodiac uh, astronomers in the early part of the 20th century divided the constellations and they gave them these fixed divisions. Some constellations are much larger in terms of how they appear against the ecliptic and then they project that position back onto the ecliptic where the constellation is way off the ecliptic, right? You could have stars far, far above the line of the path of the sun that are included in a constellation but then they get a degree position that's projected back onto the degrees of the ecliptic, which is the path of the sun. And in fact, all planets, I think it's like a nine degree range of the planets moving above and below the ecliptic. That's actually considered part of the zodiac according to this definition. So the zodiac is the path of the ecliptic and then it's the degree range above and below where the planets move in terms of how they appear to us above and below this path of the sun. Um, but of course a planet then, let's say the, the, the moon, or I, I, I don't have that memory, let's say the moon is like two degrees above, off the ecliptic. I don't have a lot of, by the way, let me just stop here. I don't have a lot of this astronomical terminology memorized as an astrologer. And you can see this discussion that I was having earlier about meaning, astrologers providing meaning. That's really what the work of the astrologer is. And we're fortunate enough in this modern context to have uh, computers um, that can, that these expert computer programmers have mastered the astronomical um, phenomena that go into the astrological practice and we're very fortunate in the 21st century to, to not have to be masters of the astronomy. Now some astrologers will tell you you need to become a master of the astronomy in order to do astrological work. I'm not in that camp. I think it's like much of the astrological world where certain astrologers can have specialties in the astronomy if that's where they're drawn. But a lot of astrologers don't. They, they just um, use the advantages we've been given in, in the 21st century via computers and then focus more on the meaning side and the creative, more, it's more like literature. They're focused on you know, deriving meaning from the observable phenomenon and less about the architecture or the inner workings of how that observable phenomenon is measured. So let me come back here. The point I wanted to make, the high level point, is just that even planets themselves, when they're, they don't move in the exact same path as the sun. Sometimes Mars is above the path of the sun or below the path of the sun. And what we do to, to give Mars a position on the zodiac is we project the position of Mars onto the ecliptic and so everything is projected back onto the ecliptic in you know most common uh, forms of uh, astrology of modern astrology the ecliptic becomes that center that 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 kind of point of reference for everything 
how we measure all of the wild movements, even fixed stars like Polaris that's way off the ecliptic, it's very high, it's the North Star, right? We can project that back down in the ecliptic, I think it's in Gemini. Um, so everything's coming back to the, the ecliptic, the apparent path of the sun in the sky as, a, as the main point of reference, and it makes sense, the sun is the life giver. I mean, without the sun we die. So using that, and it's the most consistent path. It moves very, very consistently where other planets are going retrograde or moving above and below. It's more like a sine wave. The movement of the sun is this, is this line. It's this pure line. So I think it makes complete logical sense to not only base our astrology on the ecliptic, but to base our house system on the ecliptic. And, and, and we'll get to that later. All right, let me come back. I hope this was, again, this is a very confusing topic. It's a very dense topic, so you will have to do probably more research. This is a high level introduction. Let me move here. So um, there you can see the ecliptic in this slide. I'm gonna come back now to, oh, actually I'm gonna say this here. So you see the ecliptic is the orange line in this slide. The ascendant is the point on the horizon where the ecliptic meets the horizon. That's the definition of the ascendant. So the ascendant itself is tethered to the ecliptic, um, which is maybe the most important point for natal analysis because from that ascendant, most house division um, is derived. We use even quadrant houses, most quadrant houses, and then the whole sign house system and equal house systems use the ascendant as a, a necessary point to know. Without that point, we don't know a house division because we don't um, have that anchored point. And, and to get the ascendant, we have to have a birth time. That's why having a birth time is so profound and important. Without that accurate birth time, we actually don't have an accurate house division. Now you can use, um, there's house systems that don't rely on that, like zero degrees Aries is a house system. You just set that zero degree Aries point as the, the boundary of the first house, and then you can move through that way. So there are some innovative house systems, but by and large, most house systems need an ascendant. It's an essential way to divide the, uh, the, the houses, uh, to divide, <laughs> you know, to create the 12 point, the, the 12 segmented division of houses. Okay, let me, so I just wanted to show you, you can see it here, this is the ascendant, this is where the sun will be rising. It rises right there, the ecliptic, that's the ascendant point, and that, that ecliptic and the descendant is opposite the, the ascendant. I want to make this point here now too, there is courses on Stormy's channel about the astronomy of astrology. I know she said she was starting out with that and I saw the syllabus. So I would go to those courses. They're going to give you a very in-depth, hopefully, understanding of this stuff. And there's a Cochran, a astrologer Cochran, I forgot his thing. Uh, I'm not going to try to remember his first name, based out of Florida. He's vibrational astrology. I think, uh, I don't want to think David, but the guy's an amazing, his YouTube channel is amazing, and he's got like I think a 27 hour multi YouTube video course on the astronomy of astrology. That's how complicated this stuff is. It takes 27 hours <laughs> to fully go through it all. I've got, I'm doing about 30 minutes here, so I'm, it's very light coverage. So this is just the part of this talk where I encourage you to go to these other, yeah, David Cochran, I'm remembering it now. Go to his channel, go to the Stormy Grace Academy part on astronomy for astrologers, and that's going to give you a, a much richer understanding of this stuff. So I'm going to move now. Now I want to shift to this history idea. Um, and Rob Hand, the legend, um, he, I love Rob Hand. I, I got to hear him speak at UAC 2018, one of the highlights of that year for me. One of the highlights of actually my astrological education was to be with Rob Hand and hear him speak. But um, him, astrologer James Holden, others in the 20th century, when we received um, English, we received the text of the Greek astrologers for the first time because they were, the libraries in Europe were raided. Um, these Greek texts then were brought forth and then we were able to form what are called critical editions where we get like the 30 copies of one text we build one key text and then in translators began translating these astrological texts from the Hellenistic world. And then astrologers, once they got their hands on those translations, or a lot of those astrologers did translations themselves, both James Holden and Rob Hand are translators, 
uh, we begin to understand anew the astrological practice of the earliest records we have. And so this is a paper by Rob Hand. There's a, a paper by James Holden from the early 80s on this exact same topic. But I'm just going to read it to you. This is the first paragraph. After several years of research into the oldest texts of our astrological traditions, we now know the earliest house system. We know what it was, he says. And in a way, it was not a house system at all, according to how we understood house systems before these discoveries, because the signs of the zodiac themselves were used as the house system. So remember earlier in this talk, I was saying houses are a division of 12, and sometimes they're not the same division of 12 as the zodiac, but sometimes they are, and this was the first house system we had. It's called whole sign houses. Every astrological translator I think I'm aware of that translate these, translates these older texts has reached this same conclusion. Now that doesn't mean it's the right conclusion, but um, it's the best conclusion we have with our best astrological translator minds um, reaching this conclusion. Um, and so we, we don't have to then make another division which we'll get to later. This is the quadrant house systems. They use a division that is based on the midheaven. Um, but the earliest systems we had did not use the midheaven. They just used the zodiac itself. And the 12 divisions of the ecliptic into the 12 signs of the zodiac are also the same uh, division that we'll use for the houses. And so that is to say Aries is a full house. The 30 degrees of Aries is also 30 degrees of a house in the chart, depending on where the ascendant is. And so here, here he, again he continues, in this system the rising degree of the zodiac marks the sign uh, it is located in as the first house. So if you're, so I'm going to go to this as a chart example. So this is the next slide you can see here. This is for an event that's going to be in uh, two days or four days from where I sit now recording this, but 5.30 a.m. here in Tirana. On the 14th of June, you will have the ascendant in the 28th degree of Gemini. And so in this house system, the oldest house system we have, all of the 30 degrees of the zodiac sign Gemini comprise the first house. So I like to say Gemini comprises the first house. The zodiac sign of Gemini comprises the first house. And what that does, it allows us to then have houses of equal length, degree length, and um, we have then each sign is necessarily, we know via zodiacal order, which sign comprises the rest of the houses. So the sign prior to Gemini in zodiacal order is Taurus. That would be the house prior to the first house. So the 12th house is Taurus, 11th house is Aries, so on and so forth. And it's a very, very elegant system, but this is the original system. You only needed one division of 12 and then that division was assigned a zodiac sign and assigned a house. So it's very, very clean in terms of needing only one division of 12, okay? Um, so let's see here. I'm gonna go to the next slide here. Um, the other thing I wanna make a, of a point of is mentioning in the earliest text we have, there's also another house system that's clearly there, and that is the equal house system. You find this in Valens, in the later chapters of Edius Valens, who wrote in the first century, second century AD, um, and it's the equal house system. This is a house system that, again, does not depend on the midheaven. You do not need to determine the midheaven, which we're going to talk about what that is in a second. It's basically another point on the celestial sphere that's moving and changing during the day. Um, but that is, to determine the midheaven, you're, you're, not, you're now going outside of the um, ecliptic, and you're then using the zenith to make a determination of the, the point on the midheaven. Um, so, but just to come back here, the equal house system does not depend on the midheaven. It only depends on the ecliptic because it only depends on the ascendant. All you, once you know the ascendant, the degree of the ascendant, you get this other house system that we find in Valens. This is the equal house system. And that is simply, actually, okay, I don't have this uh, I'll show you on the next slide, but it's simply, uh, and also I'll just make a, a point here. Firmicus Maternus, he wrote in Latin, I believe, 4th century AD, a little bit later, maybe 200 years later from Valens. Um, and he, there's, there's some translation questions, but we may find an equal house system also in Firmicus. Um, 
so it's there clearly in both Firmicus and Valens when they write about it they're clearly using the equal health system as one to define the, the, the topics of the 12 houses okay um, whereas the quadrant house systems you don't find them until Porphyry who's a think the fourth century AD you don't find the quadrant house system articulated as a full house system until Porphyry you do find references to using the Midheaven for other purposes, not clearly a house system in both Valens and Ptolemy. That's my take at least. So let's go down to here, what is an equal house system? Equal houses are when you take the degree of the ascendant, so you can see in this chart, and then you use that same degree. So in this case it's 28 degrees, 27 degree minutes. That degree in each zodiac sign becomes the boundary of the house. So for example, in this case, let's just go up to the 10th house. The 10th house in the equal house system will be 28 degrees of Aries to 28 degrees of Pisces. And the key point here is that you have two zodiac signs that make up each house. It's not one sign, one house. You actually have now two signs that um, are part of the makeup of each house. But you don't need knowledge of the midheaven just the ascendant and then you just project that's probably the, a wrong word because I'm going to use project in other contexts I've already used it in the context of projecting the position of a star or a planet off the ecliptic you project it onto the ecliptic using spiritual sphere, spherical trigonometry mathematics to make that projection um, here you just you just mark that degree so it's 28 degrees you just mark it for each sign and then that becomes the boundary border of the houses. That's the equal house system. One of the only two house systems by my reading that we have in the most ancient texts. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to tell you why or how. I, I'm, this talk really isn't about comparing which ones are better or worse. You'll have to make that determination through chart study, through going through house systems, reading the proponents of each house system, understanding and then making a decision intuitively and based on your chart study of which systems you want to use. This is very popular amongst British astrologers, this equal house system. I, I find that they really gravitated towards that, especially in the 20th century. It's very common in Britain. Um, so let's, let's come back now to this next slide. So again, equal houses, whole sign houses rely on that ascendant only and that's just the ecliptic and the horizon point and there's no need for knowledge of the midheaven. I already said that in the talk. Um, and I already talked about how those are the two. So the ancient house systems we have, the most ancient house systems are ecliptic based. They're ascendant based and ecliptic based. Um, now the next basket of house systems that are probably the most popular, okay, are called quadrant house systems. And they rely on these two other points, the midheaven, and the Imam Koli, or the IC. And they, I'm just going to show you here on, the, on this slide, you can see it here. This is the Midheaven, this is the Ascendant Descendant Axis, this is the Midheaven IC Axis. And the Descendant is always opposite the Ascendant. It's the exact opposite degree of, on the ecliptic. And the same with the Midheaven and the IC. They're always exactly opposite. Um, and from this, knowing these two point, these four points, then you can build a quadrant house system. Um, the next slide I'm going to show you is a list of definitions that are uh, astronomical definitions that are necessary to understand how you begin to construct a quadrant house system. And this comes from the Skyscript website. You can get the URL here on YouTube. Just look look here at it. Skyscript you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's part of their forums. Those forums are a real treasure trove of astrological knowledge. Um, many astrologers would write and debate and share knowledge there for many years. And so this was, a, a I found, just someone listing these definitions. I've always gone back to this. But the celestial sphere is the imaginary sphere surrounding the Earth. Um, effectively, I'm just going to run through these quickly with my paraphrase. The zenith is the point directly overhead on the celestial sphere, so when you walk outside and look straight up, that point is the zenith where you are in local space. The, local, the nadir is the point exactly opposite the zenith. You can't see the nadir. 
the uh, local meridian, so we, you know the prime meridian is runs through Greenwich Village, but this is just the zenith to the nadir and you draw a line uh, as, you, as if you're drawing a line outside of the celestial sphere and that's in your local space you have a local meridian, zenith to nadir. Um, the ecliptic we've already talked ab about, that's the, uh, the path of the sun that we perceive. Um, it's not the, the, the zenith, it's, um, I guess it, it, in most locations, the ecliptic um, is lower and closer to the uh, horizon line. You see that uh, path of the sun like it is in this drawing here. Um, let me see here. We go down to the um, midheaven. So the midheaven is if you were to have the local meridian, the zenith, and you've drawn this line, it's the point where the zenith hits the ecliptic. So in a way you could say the zenith projected onto the ecliptic, but it's also the point where when the sun hits the midheaven, that is, um, it's not noon according to the watch, but it can be sometimes, but it's noon according to the planetary hours. They call it here, um, let's see here, local apparent time. It's 12 noon on local apparent time. And, and so the MC is also the greatest altitude that the sun makes. If you think about the line of the ecliptic, it's the sun rising, and then at a certain point it gets to the highest point, and then it starts falling to where it was set. That highest point is the midheaven, and it's the zenith, the, the local meridian meeting the ecliptic. Okay. Um, and so th I'm just going to state that there's culminating and anti-culminating. That's basically when a, a planet intersects with the local meridian above the horizon and that's not necessarily the midheaven right because the midheaven is the ecliptic and the sun's intersection with the local meridian sometimes a planet most always planets uh, most always because sometimes the planet is on the ecliptic whenever it crosses above or below where the path of that planet cross, uh, crosses above or below the ecliptic, ecliptic that's actually called the nodes the planetary nodes or the lunar nodes. The lunar node, the ascending lunar node, is when the path of the moon crosses above the path of the sun. That's the exact point where those two paths meet and, this, and then the moon would be above the ecliptic. That's the ascending node. The descending node is, the, is when the path of the moon crosses below the ecliptic. Um, but most, most always, you know, like say 99%, 99.99% planets are off the ecliptic. But when a planet crosses the local meridian, that is the, uh, known as a, a culmination of that planet. And it's not the midheaven. The midheaven is defined based on the ecliptic. So again, this is very complicated stuff. I'm just, I'm just r r uh, rambling in a way, maybe that's the wrong word. I'm just powering through this stuff. You're gonna need to really think about it and go find other resources, especially for this uh, astronomy. Yeah. So, okay, so let me, I'm just going to move. I'm moving off of the astronomy now. I'd like you to, again, study it again, find other resources. It's, it's, a, it's an intense a study that's very complex. Actually, the one other thing I'll say is that, you know, the moon, the, 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 the Earth is rotating both around the sun, according to the modern astronomical model, and then it's also um, rotating around its axis. And then, and then it's moving around the sun while it rotates on the axis, and also then while the... Uh, I forgot what this is called, but basically the the the, um, the north and south pole are also moving around a a point here. It's not it's not a fixed pole. It it moves around a you know a center point there. Um, so there's a lot happening at simultaneously, and this is tough to visualize. I I tried to find a video that would perfectly visualize this stuff. I couldn't find one. Um, but someone will make this an Solarium. Maybe you can see it with that. I don't know about their settings, but that's a software that's free where you can see actually the night sky. Um, but the point here is, is the complexity of visualization is, is highly complex. So give yourself some patience and give yourself a break. You might not even be moved to make the astronomy of astrology central to your practice, though I would recommend exposing yourself to it and getting a basic understanding of it but you might not become like an expert or a teacher on it like some other astrologers are called to do. Um, okay, so let me, let me move here. Um, we're talking about quadrant house systems now. This is the other main basket of house systems where most practitioners 
use Quadrant House System because the whole sign system didn't exist until the 80s. They become popularized until after the uh, turn of the millennia. And the whole sign houses are very popular right now with the traditional revival, but uh, Quadrant Houses are, are still, I think, the most popular system. And, um, okay, let me come back here. Now, Equal Houses were in play for that whole time too, but they are... Uh, I don't think it's definitely not as popular as, as quadrant house uh, quadrant houses. So let me move back here. This to 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 do a quadrant house system, the division of twelve um, depends on knowing where the midheaven is, knowing where the ascendant is, and then you divide the distance between the midheaven and the ascendant into three houses. The distance between the midheaven and the, and the descendant into three houses. Um, the distance between the descendant and the I see into three houses and the distance between the IC and the ascendant into three houses. And that can, there's various ways um, to do those divisions. That's why there's so many quadrant house systems. They use different astronomy and different measurements to decide how they're going to divide um, the space between the midheaven and the ascendant into those uh, that division of three, for example. And I'll show you here on the chart, look at this slide, porphyry houses, for example. This is probably the most popular. No, this is the earliest articulated quadrant house system from my read of the ancient text. You pull up porphyries at a chapter, it says houses, and he walks through, this is how you calculate houses. It's actually interesting because in his text, he, he offsets the um, the boundary five degrees from where we now make it when we say four free houses. And this is because of something called the five degree rule. I don't want to go into that much here, but just know four free houses actually is a five degree offset. And I think if you were using pure four free houses, you would actually want to make a division five degrees off here um, earlier in the Zodiac to do a true four free house system. But no, this is where we first have a quadrant house system. It's fully articulated as a house system. Before this, it was um, the astrologers like Ptolemy discussed dividing um, the distance between the midheaven and the ascendant into three, but he's talking about it in a, in, a, in a way that's not clearly a house system. It may be for primary directions. It may be for the length of life technique that he articulates, but it's not, he doesn't say these are, this is a house system. This is how you draw the, the boundaries between all houses. And then here are the topics of these houses using this quadrant method. It's not there. So let me come back. Uh, and he's clearly using whole sign houses and other parts of the text Ptolemy is. But understand, this is a big debate. And I don't mean to trigger those of you out there that have determined you want to use quadrant houses or that you've read Ptolemy to say he definitely has a quadrant house system. Just know it's a debate. That's where I come down on it. And yeah, let's come back to the slide. You can see here how um, the when you use a quadrant house system, the the amount of degrees comprising each house gets strange. It's not 30 degrees anymore. It's most often widely different than 30 degrees. Um, and so you can see with porphyry houses here, you have these very small houses, house seven, eight, and nine are all of equal length in this system, but they're smaller because in this case, the midheavens position, that is the position of the local meridian uh, compared intersecting with the ecliptic um, happened in late Pisces. That's where the midheaven is. And it makes then the trisection, you would say, of, this, of those degrees between the midheaven and the ascendant very wide if you're looking at 10, 11, and 12, but very small if you're looking at uh, 9, 8, and 7. So this is now where we start getting into the big difference between whole sign houses and equal houses and quadrant houses is that, that the house, the degrees that comprise each house can be have this wide variance. Um, here, are, and so you can see with the comparison I've got here with whole sign houses, in this case, the uh, Pisces and Aries, the 10th house is mostly Pisces and Porphyry in this quadrant house system. And there's some, I'd say about a fourth of the 10th house is Aries where, in whole sign houses, Aries comprises all of the 11th house, and Pisces comprises all of the 10th house. In porphyry houses, Pi Pisces, that, that those beginning degrees of Pisces and where Jupiter is, um, are in the 
what is that in the eighth house? And actually, actually, let me see here. It's four degrees. Sorry, the mid heaven is four degrees. If you're using the five degree rule, which a lot of quadrant, I'd say even not, not, I don't know how many quadrant house practitioners use the five degree rule. A lot of them do, but some don't. Some don't, by the way. You can read some texts that when they define the houses, they don't even mention the quadrant houses, they don't even mention the five degree rule. But let's assume we're going to use the five degree rule. So all of those, um, degrees of Pisces would be drawn into the 10th house with using that five degree rule. But let me see if I can find here another example. Um, you might find like the fifth house in this quadrant house system. Many of those early degrees of Scorpio are in the fifth house. Whereas if you go to whole sign houses, Scorpio comprises only the sixth house. So you can see now these differences, they're stark differences. The sixth house is the house of health and a house of feeling you know, um, overwhelmed with your daily life, you know, feeling like you may be in kind of trapped with your daily activities or with your work. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult house. The fifth house is a house of joy, fun, abundance, being in the zone. They're very different in terms of significations. And the house system you choose may assign degrees of the zodiac into two very different houses so that you can see how important this choice is. Uh, for, uh, for astrologers. So this is porphyry to whole sign, but I'm using porphyry here also as a stand-in for quadrant houses generally to show you this big, big difference. Um, and, you know, I want you to, I encourage you here, astro.com has a whole astro wiki. They have a whole wiki entry in quadrant house systems. This is from them, their definition. Although all house systems in use today involve a projection of a 12-fold division of the cosmos onto the ecliptic, so actually, um, that's not true. Whole sign houses does not involve a um, projection of a 12-fold division of the cosmos that, um, onto the ecliptic. Um, you don't need to project. You actually just divide the ecliptic itself. Um, so a slight edit there. Um, in terms of which reference points to use to bisect the celestial sphere and whether the house divisions represent measurements of segment in time or of distance, that's where you get these different types of quadrant house system. Some, some measure segments of time or of distance when measuring how they want to trisect that, those divisions uh, between the midheaven and the IC, and then the ascendant descendant. Then they trisect each of those four um, pieces of the pie that were. All right, let me, let, me, let me move here. I just wanted to read that definition. Um, but go to this site. They talk here, advantages and disadvantages. They go through a lot of the aspects of quadrant house division that I won't cover here. Remember, this is just supposed to be a 30 minute, very, very general talk. I'm trying to keep it as general as possible and as useful as possible with some high level points that you can then use for a basis of jumping off in your own studies. I wanted to point out here an example. Here's Reggio Montanus houses, and this is Placidus houses. And you can see here, these are two different quadrant house systems. They both use different measurements for um, dividing the celestial sphere into this 12 division. And here's an example here. Look at the part of fortune. So in Regium and Tanis houses, the part of fortune is on the, uh, you might call this the south side of the um, cusp there. So it is, uh, of the, the, uh, this would be the first south, the third house cusp. Whereas in Placidus houses, the part of fortune is on the north side uh, of the, that is to say the side closest to the IC of the third house cusp. So, you know, the uh, quadrant house cusps, um, and that is the, how they divide the pi. They draw the, the, the division there. Those cusps in quadrant houses, they will actually, um, you know, make these points that we're interested in the planets or the part of fortune falling on different sides of those cusps. So you'll have to study, you'll have to study why you would prefer Regimentanus or Placidus. Um, there's people that write about that. I know Ryan Butler, astrologer Ryan Butler has a whole Twitter thread on it. He made a few years back where he goes through why this is a good quadrant house uh, division, what this particular quadrant house division is useful for, what it prioritizes in terms of what it's measuring. These are complicated ideas and, and some astrologers, again, will break that down for you. And as you 
decide what health system you'd like to use. The other thing I want to point out is that astro.com has a, a FAQ and FAQ on frequently uh, asked questions, charts, and health systems on their website. It's very, very good. They break down many of these systems and describe who invented the system, some of the advantages, some of the disadvantages. Um, so I encourage you to just explore these basic resources as a jumping off place, like I said. All right, so I'm coming to a, a close here. Um, this again was just a high level overview. I hope I've added value to your practice, especially for new learners. I know I've blazed through this stuff and I've, and I've probably gone too fast for some of you. And I apologize for that. I'm just trying to get through enough here to give you really, um, um, again, jumping off place, information that then you can take and then begin your journey because no 30 minute talk is going to be able to do this topic justice. But I want to tell you uh, why, what house system I use to close here and why. So I'm a whole sign houses practitioner. I go back to that original house system that was the earliest that we have in, in the texts. And I, I think it's um, for me and how I practice um, the division using one division of 12, that is to say the signs of the Zodiac and only having one division of 12 that we, that we then use for both signs and houses um, is more elegant. Um, and it doesn't com uh, complicate by having two separate divisions of 12 that then we have to compare with each other. We don't complicate that. Um, and it jives better with whole sign aspect theory that's the kind of aspect theory that I practice, which is um, based in affinities between zodiac signs. It explains why a trine is, is auspicious because in whole sign aspect theory, all fire signs make a trine with each other. Um, that's the nature of them all being fire. Is they have this great affinity and can work together because they share an element. And you find this in Ptolemy. Um, he um, writes about aspects according to the affinity between signs. So um, when you, and this is an example, if you have the Ascendant in Leo and then Mars in Aries, we know that you would have a fire trine, right? You would have Mars, but that would also be the ninth house. Aries in this whole sign house system, the whole ninth house is all 30 degrees of Aries. And so no matter what degree Mars is in, Mars is making a ninth house uh, trine to, from the ninth house to the first house. And it explains why we get our house significations, actually. This is, the, to, to me, um, uh, explaining where the significations of the houses come from. We know that the ninth house is generally considered a positive house. Of all the cadent houses, it's maybe the most positive. It's above the horizon. It's in that place still making this trying to the ascendant. The ninth house is one where we have kind of expansive ideas in terms of religion, philosophy. Um, these things can imp impact us positively often. And if you use a quadrant house system, you might end up having Mars in Aries, but in the eighth house because of the way that the, um, the celestial sphere then is divided up, projected back on the ecliptic by quadrant house practitioners. And for me, that's difficult and it's mismatched with the underlying theory of sign relationships and then therefore aspects. The eighth house is a really difficult house. We looked at the example earlier, right, of the fifth house versus the sixth house. And this is how starkly things can change. So you could even have an exact trine from Mars in an eighth house, exact trine to the ascendant, and that that would still be considered uh, in the eighth house. I just, to me, that's a, a, a complete breakdown, again, of the underlying philosophy of both house signification and aspect theory. So um, I want to, uh, that's why I use whole site houses. It locks in the elegance of the whole system. For me, the whole system then can actually come into its full flowering with um, the whole site house system. You know, um, and, and that's, I'm just going to move on from there. I will say this, Quadrant House, Quadrant House advocates, they say that they're gaining more tools for interpretation by, you, by extracting from the ecliptic this division of houses using the celestial sphere and, and the zenith projected onto the ecliptic, that is to say the midheaven, and then, and then splicing that 
they are you they say that they're gaining gaining tools so for them they actually are empowered with these kind of new tools and that's the house cusps things like intercepted houses i'm not even going to go to that go into that in this talk so i'm not going to say i'm right they have arguments for the tools that they're gaining from using the quadrant houses and again i encourage you and this is what i want to say here to kind of close you're going to find your own path you need to study study chart examples go to practitioners you know ask them why do you use this house system they're going to have an answer like the one i just gave you for my practice and then you'll find your own path your heart will call you to a house system it will call you to that system and um, you will be empowered with as the artist that you'll be the astrological artist that you'll become to find those tools that can best express your soul and your kind of astrological soul as it wants to manifest and give to the world of astrology and give to the world at large so i encourage you to find your own way uh, always all my students i'm not right the other astrologers aren't right you're right when you align with your own purpose as an astrologer i mean i will say this is one of the most um kind of innovative ideas i've seen along the topic of house division and this is from Dr. Jen, Jen Zart, who was my initiatrix into astrology. She um, offers something called the open house system, which is you use the house system that was used by the originator of the technique in question. So if you want to do um, horary in the style of William Lilly, you're going to use Reggio Montanus houses. That's how he taught, and all of his chart examples are based on Reggio Montanus. If I'm reading natal charts like Valens, I'm going to use whole sign houses um, or equal houses. If you're going to make the case that he was using equal houses, I don't think he was. I think most of the book, except that later chapter where he talks about equal houses, it's kind of out of place. Most of his text is uh, whole sign houses. So if I'm going to use a Valens style system, I'll use whole sign houses according to this model. And I like it because it is open. She calls it open house systems, but it is welcoming and it is not exclusionary to any of our, breth our brethren or our siblings or you know, our astrological siblings out there. Um, we need to support each other. We need to uplift each other and encourage each other's innovation, even if there's techniques that we don't agree with or, or sort of we don't. If we haven't reached the same conclusion about the power of a technique, we still need to encourage and support each other is my view. And this open house system, I think, um, is part, it includes that ethos. All right, so I'm going to close it there. This has been S.J. Anderson, Housing Systems and Introduction for Stormy Grace's YouTube Academy. I wish you all the best out there on your journey. And you can find my work, sjanderson144.com. Follow me there. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at sjanderson144. And I look forward to being a part of your journey. I'm grateful, actually. I've been able to be a part of your journey to whatever extent I have. And uh, you can always message me or contact me through my social media or my website if you have any questions. Good luck to you. Take care.